Well, hello, everybody. My name is Nate. If we haven't met, and I'm so happy we get to be together. It's good to see you. Everybody who's um, watching or listening in another place, thanks for being with us as well. There's always a, a few places. Um, it's just this morning I was thinking about a women's prison, and you join us. I want you to know we praying for you, believing you guys are doing good things in your life. Hey, last week we started a series uh, going back to an emphasis we've had in the past, simply teach me. And here's the whole idea, is oftentimes when it comes to following Jesus, whether you are just investigating or you've been following Jesus for years, we think what I need is more information. And information is important. Truth is very important. I'm not saying it's not important. But there are two passages of scripture that have struck me significantly over the couple of, last couple of years that say it goes beyond information. Uh, the first would be this. When Jesus speaks his final words to his disciples before he ascends into heaven, he says, I want you to go into all the world and make disciples. And I want you to teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. So not just teach and disperse information, but Jesus says what my disciples will really need is to hear the information and then actually carry it out. Teach them to obey these radical things that Jesus asks of his followers. He asks us to forgive our enemies. He asks us to love when it's difficult to love. He asks us to lay down our rights and pick up a cross and follow him. The second passage of scripture is a parable where Jesus is talking about two different individuals who at the same time with the same materials, both build a house. And a storm comes, one house collapses, the other house survives the storm. And as he's explaining this parable, he says, here's the difference. We can build any type of house, but he says, the person who survives the storms in life is the one who hears my words and puts them into practice. So when I hear the words of Jesus and then go to the next step of, I actually put the words of Jesus into practice, that creates a strength in our lives that helps us to survive storms. And there are very few things that I want more for all of us than to have lives that survive turmoil. And we survive turmoil, how? Not by gathering and gleaning more information, but taking the things that were taught from Jesus and actually carrying them out. So we don't wanna be, as followers of Jesus, simply theoreticians. We want to be practitioners, practitioners. So last week we looked at this command of Jesus, do not worry, do not worry. And we saw that Jesus gives us a, a way to redirect all of our concerns. He says, instead of worrying, do this, prioritize seeking first my kingdom, seeking first my kingdom. And then hopefully this week we, We put that into practice. We were working through that. Here's what I'd like us to look at this week and then try to actually put into practice in the days ahead. It's a simple statement, but it is one of the most frequently repeated statements in all the Bible. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Now, fear is a incredibly complex thing in our lives. Um, Some of us are unaware of our fears. Some of us are very aware of our fears. Some of our fears make little sense. Some of them, there is a very clear reason why we're afraid. Fear fear can be as silly as this. Um, The first church that I worked at, we had a music director who, his name was Gene, and Gene was just as organized. He's like an engineer when it comes to music but he had this strange phobia that I had never heard of it. I think it's called hemophobia. And he, like this very logical person, but if audibly he heard anything that had to do with blood and trauma, he just pass out, just pass out. So this is no joke. It's a good Friday service. He's our music director. And the senior pastor, my pastor Steve is teaching and he's walking through the the trauma that Jesus experiences on the cross. And Gene is behind him, like padding, playing music. And I'm like, oh, what's happening? Because Gene is, he's talking about the crucifixion. You start to see him like go in a couple of wrong notes are hit. And then he gets like into like the whole crucifixion. And Gene just like, boom. And he, 
he falls over and he's laying at the foot of the piano, but the senior pastor doesn't see him. So we just keep going. <laughs> we do communion after communion. Gene, like he, he, he comes to, you know, a good like eight minutes later and he's laying on the ground like, what happened? <laughs> I'm like, whatever that fear is you have, man, it took over. Some of our fears, there's nothing humorous about them though. Fear can paralyze us, it can hold us, it can inhibit growth and develop in our lives, it can uh, influence you for a lifetime. And there are so many places where Jesus just looks at his followers and says, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. We're gonna eventually land in Mark chapter four, but I just want to read a few different places where Jesus tells his disciples not to be afraid. First one is in Luke chapter 12, where Jesus says, do not be afraid, little flock. Your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Jesus uses this pastoral language, shepherd language, where he's looking at his disciples who are scared. They're scared of what might happen in the future. And he says, hey, I don't want you to be afraid, little flock. Because your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. And this, this, this phrase right here is just loaded with meaning. It means you're not insignificant. It means that when you become a follower of Jesus, God is pleased to include you as a son, as a daughter. You become a prince or a princess of this new kingdom. And there's this language of you're protected by the shepherd, your little flock. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 10. So do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. There's this daily concern of, am I enough? Will there be enough? And Jesus just looks at his disciples and says, you don't have to be afraid about whether or not God notices or sees or cares. God cares for sparrows. We looked at that last week. You're worth more than any sparrow. Next passage of scripture where Jesus says this is in John chapter 14. Jesus has just told his disciples that he will not be with them any longer and he'll be dying. And they're, they're like, no, 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 that can't happen. Like, you can't leave us. It's this deep fear of abandonment. They're looking towards the future. They've given up everything to follow him. And Jesus says, I'm not even gonna be here any longer. And so there's this terror. And Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he goes on to say, in my father's house, there are many rooms and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. So when you look towards the future and there's fear, Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. This next one is when it's just a moment of profound crisis. There's a man named Jarius and he has a daughter who is so sick and she's on death's door. And so he sends people, last ditch effort is maybe this Jesus person I keep hearing about could come and intervene and save my daughter's life. Mark chapter five, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? He doesn't have to come. It's too late. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid. Just believe in the midst of impossible circumstances. When it seems it's too late, it's over. Jesus says this, do not be afraid. Just believe. I want us to look at Mark chapter four. This is one of at least three different times where Jesus and his disciples are on a boat and it doesn't go well. You ever been on a boat trip that didn't go well? Um, I was thinking of it, Jen and I one time decided to rent a boat and uh, it was like one of the worst days of our lives, wasn't it? Like everything came apart, everybody, like it was a 50 mile trip and no one wanted to be there and we had to go home and the boat came apart and this like massive waves and it, it was just like, this was the worst family outing we've ever experienced. And I am responsible, right? One of those moments. 
So Jesus is on a boat and there's a storm. And he's going to give us these incredible principles about fear and how to deal with fear as a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus at this point, if you're spiritually unresolved, you have to deal with fear in a completely different way. But this is how Jesus deals with the fear that's in our lives. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. We'll come back to this. But just notice this, Jesus initiates them getting into a boat. See a galley? Any other part of the world, you'd call it a big lake, okay? It's about 13 miles wide at its widest. It is not a massive thing at all, but Jesus initiates crossing the Sea of Galilee. And so everybody gets in the boat because Jesus told them to. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall. One thing that would be important to note is that about half of Jesus' 12 disciples were fishermen by trade. So they are very familiar with this lake. They've probably spent six days a week fishing this lake. They know what storms are like. They know the capacity of their boats. And they describe this as a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. So I want you to get this picture The waves are coming up over the side of the boat. The boat begins to fill up with water. This is not a good situation. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. You have to be really tired. You know what I'm saying? Like like everybody's bailing water and screaming and yelling and they look at Jesus and what's Jesus doing? What is happening? The disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care? Don't you care? Do you notice? Are you immune? Are you so checked out that you don't know what is happening? Don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? As I've been studying this passage, I feel like for many of us, this is the question that Jesus continues to ask. Why? Why are you so afraid? Why is that thing, that fear, why are you allowing it to paralyze your life? Why are you operating instead of in confidence? Why are we operating in fear? Do you still have no faith? After the things that you've been through, are you still lacking faith? They were terrified. Mark's brilliant here. So he uses a a different Greek word. Remember, they're, they're scared of the storm. But now there's a new word that's introduced. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So this is a, it's a sense of awe. It's a sense of respect in just a flash of a moment. They are scared to death of the sea and the storm and what will happen to them. You give it just a few seconds and suddenly they have a brand new type of fear operating in their life. And it's an awe and a deep profound respect and they look at Jesus And they are filled with holy awe, with terror. Who is this? Who speaks the wind? Who speaks the waves? Who has power over the storms in our lives? We'll explore that in just a few minutes. Let's walk through this. Number one, 
I think whenever we are facing fear in our lives, we ask this question, how did I get here? How did I get here? Here's my typical way of thinking. I think, well, if I just line up with Jesus, if I'm obedient to him, if I am listening and try to do whatever he tells me to do, my hope is that he will help me navigate around the storms that happen in life. But in this instance, who sends them into the storm? It's Jesus. And part of the resentment that we see in this passage is because they're thinking this. They're like, Jesus told us to get into the boat. He told us to go at night. We probably looked up and we saw, hey, there's the potential for a storm. But Jesus is the one who sent us into this storm. Now, why in the world would Jesus do that? I think it's the storms in life where we learn, where we grow. If, if the storm hadn't happened, here's just what, the, I don't even know if the passage would be recorded in the New Testament. They got into the boat, Jesus took a long nap, <laughs> they rowed him across, they got to the other side, end of story. But there's way more drama involved, isn't there? They got into the boat, they said, okay, if you tell us to go, we'll go. And somewhere in the middle of that lake, now I've been on that lake, some of you guys have been on that lake. Um, I've been on that lake and they like play music and teach you some like Jewish dancing because it's a pretty calm place. And you like eat a little meal there on the lake. It, it's, it's not a terrifying place whatsoever when there's no storm, but you add a storm and everything changes. And so they're asking this question, how could this happen to us? We did what Jesus told us to do, which was to get into the boat. And now look what happened. Jesus, very important principle. Jesus very well might send me into storms, but he will never send me into a storm alone. He'll never send me into a storm where like he's absent from the boat and I'm just walking, bailing, doing everything I possibly can. Jesus will say, hey, I'll, I'll send you into storms because storms are the thing that transform you. It moves you from a cruise to a lesson. But I'll always be in that boat with you. Whatever storm, whatever chaos, whatever fear-inspiring situation that you face, I will always be in the boat with you. Here's the second thing. We gotta look at this idea that in the midst of the storm, Jesus is sleeping on a cushion. And a storm probably builds fairly rapidly. It becomes a dangerous situation. Water's coming in. And like Mark just says, and here was the craziest thing. It's pouring rain. There's wet, there's wind, there's noise, there's chaos. And Jesus is just sleeping through it all. And you wonder like, how could he do that? Was it, was it kind of like a, you know, eyes open, like, I wonder what they're gonna do. I wonder when they're gonna come get me. Or was he like genuinely asleep? I don't know. I've never been a huge fan of naps. I remember in kindergarten, I don't know why this stands out in my mind, but I was so excited because they said one of the things you have to bring in your little backpack was a beach towel. And I thought like, this is gonna be great. Like, what are we gonna do, slip and slide or go swimming? And I was so bummed out the first day, the kindergarten teacher said, bring your beach towel. And then we had to lay them out and there was like 30 minutes of nap time during kindergarten. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. And I mean, some kids, like you take a nap. I just laid there, it was like 30 minutes. She turned off the lights and I was like, I can't do this. Lay still for 30 minutes. I've never been a big fan of naps. Jesus apparently is a big fan of naps. He, he, he can sleep through any storm. Now, how in the world can Jesus sleep through the storm? What's the lesson here? What is Mark trying to tell us? He's trying to tell us this. There has never been a crisis in heaven. There might be crisis in my heart. There might be overwhelming fear in my home. There might be something happening at my place of work. There might be something in the past that continues to follow me, but there has never been a crisis with Jesus. When you are all powerful and all knowing, you just don't become afraid. And whatever is happening in my life, here's the point that Mark is trying to get across. Whatever you feel, 
Take a look at Jesus. And Jesus is not feeling what you feel. You're like bailing water and wondering. You're projecting into the future what is going to happen if I go down and I drown. What happens to my family? What's it going to be like when I take that first full lungful of water into my lungs? Like, what is this going to look like? And you look at Jesus and he's just like, whatever it is that causes great consternation and fear in my life, here's what I want you to think about. Jesus is not afraid of that thing. He, he is not panicking. He, he's not looking at my relationships and going, oh no, what's going to happen to you? He's not looking at my financial reality. He's not looking at my retirement. He, Jesus is not looking at our nation and elections and political things around the world and going like, what's happening? I can't believe this. He's just... He's just calm as can be. Because he, he's got it all under control. Jesus doesn't panic. Here's the third thing. When I experience a storm, when I experience the things that cause me profound fear, what happens in our lives is we develop resentment. Resentment. Let's talk a little bit about the resentment of the disciples on the boat, our resentment. What's the question that they ask when they wake him up? Don't you care that we're about to drown? It, I don't know exactly what happened, but they're probably bailing and they're doing everything to keep this boat headed in the right direction. We got to hit these waves straight on. And uh, they're just like any moment and they're wondering who's going to wake up Jesus? Jesus is just sleeping through all of this. And every bucket full of water that you dump out and every wave that beats against that boat and causes it to list and you wonder, is this the one? It's a rising resentment until one of them steps forward and wakes Jesus. And I don't think this was like a, oh, excuse me, Jesus. This is like, Jesus, don't you care? I'm experiencing this profound fear. I'm paralyzed. This storm is threatening my very existence. I'm looking towards the future and I cannot see a way out of this. Don't you care that we're about to drown? See, here, here's what the things that inspire fear in us tend to do is they create resentment that stirs and grows in my life. And the longer that storm, the longer I deal with that fear, the more significant my resentment towards God becomes. And I have walked with so many people who have gone through hard, they are genuinely brutal, difficult storms with real fear. And here's what happens. If I am not careful, I never wake up Jesus and I just watch him sleep. And if I make it through that storm, I am just mad at him for the rest of my life. Do you know what was happening in my life? And you, you were inactive. You didn't address it. You didn't come and comfort me. What is Jesus waiting for them to do? He's waiting for them to come to him and wake him up and say, don't you care? Don't you care? Here's the thing about storms. Every storm, everything that causes fear in your life and my life has the potential to do one of two things. It will either make me bitter or it will make me better. I either become bitter at God and wonder how could he let this happen to me? This is so painful or a storm has the option of making me a different person, of changing me, developing me, that I actually push through the fear and I realize that there is more than just a storm. There is a God, there is a realm, there is a reality that is more significant than any storm that I face. Point number four, Jesus is bigger. Jesus is bigger than whatever it is that causes fear to exist in my life. He's bigger than wind, he's bigger than waves. He is bigger than my problems at work, than my concerns about the future. He's bigger than a financial crisis. He's bigger than whatever it is. And so when Jesus, wakes up, oh, I 
everybody's freaking out. He stands up. Peace. Be still. And everything becomes completely calm. Galilee is like glass. Here's a really important concept. In any storm that you or I are in, I can't bail water fast enough. I can't control the waves or the wind or the intensity of the storm. In fact, I'm not even very good at controlling the fear that rises in my life. But Jesus can speak to any situation that we face. And he can speak peace, shalom, be still. When you are facing a storm, what you will hear is the storm itself making noise, it's a cacophony, it's threatening, it's smashing waves against the boat, it's howling wind. Everything in a storm makes you afraid. It is so loud, it's audible. The storm, the fear, the fear will speak to you. The fear will say, you're not gonna make this through. You are not enough. There is no future for you. This thing that happened is gonna overwhelm you. Your fear will always have a voice, always. And it will always be the voice of the enemy. And it will be an enemy that says, God is not enough. You won't be rescued. And here's how you reverse the storm. Jesus speaks to the storm. And we have to get to the place where we stand up. And rather than just hearing and letting the sound of the storm overwhelm, I need to hear from Jesus what he's saying to that storm. And then I step forward and I speak to the fear. Fear will always be speaking to you. I speak to the fear. And this is what I would suggest, is you put something from Jesus deep within your heart. When I faced storms in the past, here's the first scripture that comes to mind. God is not giving you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And I speak to the storm and I tell that storm, no, no, you don't get to influence me. I am speaking to you, fear. And I'm telling you what's real. You, you see this in 1 Samuel chapter 17. You see this, uh, this young, somewhere between 14 and 16 year old boy named David. And uh, Dave, David's been left out of the battle. There's a standoff between the people of Israel and the Philistines. And David's just been at home being a shepherd. He's the youngest of several brothers. And the poor guy, his dad sends him to the battlefield with, get this, seven cheeses in a basket. So here comes David. Like, can you just, like this just, when you're showing up to a battle, you want to carry weapons, but gee, here's David carrying like seven cheese blocks. The cheese delivery boy has shown up to the battle and there is a man named Goliath of Gath and he comes out day after day and he speaks because fear always speaks. And he says, I defy you, I defy your gods. I, I challenge one of you to come out. And there are thousands of men on the battlefield and all they hear is the voice of Goliath because it's loud and it's intimidating and they draw back and day after day, no one has addressed the fear. And here comes David with his cheese and he walks out and he's the only one that's willing to speak to the fear. Goliath looks at him and just like fear will always do, it begins to speak. And he says, who are you? You're just a boy that you come at me with sticks and rocks. Here's what I'm going to do, says Goliath. I'm going to kill you and I am going to defy God's, your God's armies on this very day. And you know what David does? Instead of doing what all the other men did, you're right, you're huge. You're scary. I'm going to go find my cheese. Here's, here's the one little 14 year old boy. It's probably two feet shorter, a few hundred pounds lighter. 
And here's Goliath. He stands up and he speaks to the fear. He says, in actuality, here's what it's about to happen. I'm speaking to the big, hairy giant. God has delivered me with this little sling and a few little rocks from lions and bears in the past. And today, he's going to deliver you, Mr. Fear, into my hands. And on top of that, it's like a good biblical cussing out, right? On top of that, he goes, and when this is done, I'm going to chop off your head. And I'm going to feed it to the birds. We leave that part of the story out when we tell kids the story. They're like, <laughs> you know, like, blah. We just like the stone, the guy falls over, right? Not the head chopping off part. And Goliath is like, no one's ever spoke to me before. When I, when I speak, people listen. When fear speaks, we tend to listen. But here's what Jesus does with fear. He speaks right at it. He establishes a new reality. In the storm that you and I experience, how in the world can I follow the teachings of Jesus when he says, do not be afraid, when there are so many things to be afraid of? You speak to that fear. Instead of being a listener, you let Jesus determine what's true and you speak that out loud in the face of the fear. Here's the fourth, uh, fifth and final thing. We have to replace fear with fear. Okay, what do I mean by that? So this type of fear is natural. This is, this is the wave, the storm, the winds, the we're not gonna make it through. This is an impossible situation. I am terrified. It makes me wanna hide. And what happens in this passage is that transformation that we talked about. They go from being afraid of a storm to holy fear. They were terrified. So we're not, we're not great with this in our culture. In fact, even in the English language, this is very difficult for us to understand. But you'll find in the ancient Old Testament, you'll find a lot of this in the book of Proverbs. Things like this. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear the Lord, which we could probably translate this more, a sense of awe and reverence. In fact, in one of these storms, when Jesus saves them, we're told this, that the disciples fell to their knees and they were in absolute awe. And so what happens is this transference of fear. They're not afraid of a storm. In seconds, the one who speaks to the storm, they become overwhelmed with respect and awe. And they say this, who is this? Who is this? That the thing that caused me so much fear, he spoke to it and it ended. Who has the capacity over the elements? Who has the ability to speak to my angst. Who is it? It's, it's Jesus. And what happens in this passage is a transformation from unrighteous fear to beautiful awe and respect, a fear of God, which makes me more honoring of who Jesus is. Let Jesus replace our fear, our fear of the unknown, our fear of what could be with fear of God awe and respect. I want to conclude with this stuff. I want to um, show you a scripture which has just been, since my childhood, has meant a whole lot to me. It's in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 9. This is written 3,400 years ago. It's that old. And <clears throat> the people of Israel... They faced 400 years of slavery. They faced 40 years with Moses as their leader, wandering through a desert. And now Moses is dead, and a new guy named Joshua is going to lead them into this promised land that they've been waiting for for centuries. Centuries. Problem is, promised land is filled with other people, right? It's not like a vacant place. So they're scared to death. I would love for you to take this scripture 
put it in your heart. Put it in your heart. Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Here's the beauty of this passage. If we walk away and we think, okay, the key is me to have more fortitude. The key is for me to be braver. That's not the key to dealing with fear. The key to dealing with fear is this, understanding that whatever I face, the Lord will be with me wherever I go. I'm never in that boat alone, desperate. Jesus is there, the one who has the power to speak to the wind and the waves. So I don't have to be discouraged. I don't have to be fearful. I can learn a new way of standing up and speaking. You know how many times I've quoted this? When I feel fear rising up in me, and it just reminds me, I'm speaking to the fear, the fear saying, you're not enough, you'll never make it, this is impossible, this thing's gonna fall apart, this is what you speak. You speak to it. Um, so I, I started thinking through this, this passage about a month and a half ago. And I'm, I'm typically not a very feel, fearful person, but we had a, a couple of things, something that, um, our daughter and her family were going through their, their missionaries in a closed access country and there was elevated persecution and there were multiple imprisonments and like you're thinking about your baby girl and your grandkids and your son-in-law and it is, it is not something that is easily influenced. Like I can't influence, I can't change it. There was something happening with one of our sons and he, he was on a deployment and it's just dangerous. And I found myself like, this doesn't happen to me but I'd be a little bit awake at night and uh, whew, thinking through like what could happen. And it just, guess what? The wind got louder and the waves became bigger and bigger. And here, here's the picture I got after reading this passage. I'm in, I'm like holding on and bailing water and I look and there's Jesus. And he's sleeping and he just opened his eyes. And he said this and he patted the cushion next to him. And I just knew that Jesus was saying this to me, come and take a nap with me. And I told him like, I haven't like kit naps since kindergarten. They're, they're boring. And Jesus said, come here, no, no, just lay down, take a nap with me. And I'll tell you what, I've, I've just been trying to do that. Hey, what's gonna happen? In the future, I don't know. But I'm just gonna try to lay down next to Jesus and not just like keep watching the storm through his squinted eyes and stay where I'm gonna try to close my eyes and be at peace that the Lord of the storm, the Lord of the storm is there with me. Why are you so afraid? I don't have to be. Will you pray with me? You asked that question 2,000 years ago, Jesus, and you ask it today. Why are you so afraid? And the reason is because fear always has a voice. And it speaks of what might happen and is threatening. And we become frantic in trying to save the ship when in reality, the Lord of the storm is right there with us. The one who has the power to speak to fear, to take turmoil and create calm. Lord, you have asked us not to be afraid, and many of us, we've become habitual in our fear. We've been fighting fear for a long time. I pray that there would be a new voice and there would be a new reality as you speak to the storms in our life and we take a nap with Jesus and abandon what we've always done 
in the midst of storms. We give you our fear. We speak new realities. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for walking through that. A couple of thoughts. If you're here and um, you need a Bible or you just have questions about who Jesus is, there are Bibles that are free at the Welcome Center and there are people up front you can trust. They will talk to you. They'd love to pray for anybody who has any needs. As you go, be the hands and feet and mouthpiece of Jesus. God bless you. You're loved.